morning, everyone. So we're going to get started in a few minutes. So if you're thinking about getting that uh, refill of coffee or grabbing something to eat, now would be the time. So probably about three or so more minutes.
morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out for this uh, this one of our monthly forums on food policy. Um, I'm Craig Willingham. I'm the deputy director here at the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. We are a research and action center that focuses on a wide range of food policy related topic areas. Uh, everything from food insecurity to jobs in the food sector to urban agriculture and including issues related to food purchasing policy and procurement. And today's discussion falls within that realm. We're going to be talking about the Good Food Purchasing Program and what adoption has looked like in other cities around the country, what it might mean for New York to adopt the Good Food Purchasing Program, and what are the sorts of barriers and facilitators to making sure that any good food purchasing policy that's implemented is robust and meaningful for the people who are invested in the five different value categories that make up the good food purchasing program. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, if you have your phone with you, which I imagine most of you do, you can take a moment to put it on vibrate. Uh, additionally, if you're going to be using social media, uh, the hashtag GFPP is the hashtag that we're using today for this forum, and we hope that you'll be very active and you know, put out lots of uh, tweets on Twitter and you know, hashtags on Instagram if those, for those of you who'd like to be active on social media. And um, lastly, I'll just make two points. We, in our newsletter that came out a couple of days ago, released an executive summary for a report that is forthcoming at the end of June on bringing the Good Food Purchasing Program to New York City and what are the sorts of ways in which you know, this you know, approach to procurement could impact food purchasing for uh, a few different city agencies and other entities. And um, I hope you had a chance to read that executive summary. If not, uh, it should be in your inboxes for those of you who are on our mailing list. And if you're not on our mailing list, you can sign up there at the table. Um, and the full report will be released at the end of June, and it, it's a really comprehensive look at the ways in which you know, the power of procurement can be transformative for the way that you know, city government does business and how it can have ripple effects on the various vendors that the city deals with. Uh, lastly, I want to do a quick mention of our next forum, which will be at the end of June, and it will be focused on the city's effort to develop an urban agriculture plan. Uh, which we're hoping is going to come before the city council very soon. And it's, a, it's an issue that you know, is of interest to lots of people in New York City. I, I, I think New York City is the capital, if not one of the capitals of urban agriculture in the world. And you know, the fact that we don't have an, an urban agriculture plan really you know, is a glaring omission to the way in which city sh the city should be thinking about you know, the way it organizes urban agriculture. So I hope that you can attend. Uh, stay tuned for more information on that. So without further ado, we're going to get started. I'm going to invite uh, Kylie Rapassi, who is our research assistant here at the Urban Food Policy Institute, who's uh, done an extensive amount of work on our Good Food Purchasing Program report. And she's going to give you a bit of an overview of our findings. So Kylie. Everybody. Uh, okay. Um, so, as Craig mentioned, we are really excited to be launch or uh, publishing our report at the end of this month. Um, and the title is Bringing the Good Food Purchasing Program to New York City Barriers and Facilitators to Select Institutions. My goal today is just to provide an overview of our research methods, what we found, um, and to then leave you wanting more. So, you read that very comprehensive report that, again, is coming out at the end of the month. Um, I wanted to just do a really brief overview of what the GFPP is, since some of you in this room might not know, um, but our panelists have extensive knowledge on the GFPP, so all of the questions that you might have, they're the ones to ask. Um, but the GFPP is really targeting what Kevin Morgan terms the public plate, and those are the meals and snacks that are prepared and served by city agencies as well as the meals and snacks that are partially or wholly financed by city or government funds and then are prepared and served by private entities. Um, as I said, the GFPP targets that public plate and it is a metric-based 
flexible framework that encourages large and often public institutions to direct their buying power towards supporting the five GFP values, which are nutrition, local economies, environmental sustainability, um, valued workforce, and animal welfare. I think the best way to describe the GFPP is to say that it is designed to do for the food system what LEED certification did to shift government dollars to more efficient, environmentally sound buildings. Um, and it really operates under the notion that if institutions shift their spending, billions of dollars that are spent on food purchases can then influence supply chains, um, contribute to transforming our food system into one that is more equitable and sustainable. Brief overview of how it works, but basically once an agency or institution decides to pursue adoption of the GSPP, there are four stages that it would have to go through. Um, meeting baseline standards, within all of those five value categories, um, incorporating those standards into reporting requirements and RFPs and contracts, um, achieving that supply chain transparency so that progress moving forward can be tracked and verified, and then verification, which is working with the Center for Good, good Food Purchasing um, to verify compliance and celebrate successes. Um, I'll mention that the Center for Good Food Purchasing is based out of Los Angeles. So that was formed in 2015 in response to nationwide interest in pursuing a policy like the GFPP in cities across the country. The GFPP itself was formed in 2012 in Los Angeles by um, more than 100 experts in all five value categories who use evidence-based um, standards to develop a comprehensive scoring system for all five value categories. The, diagram at the bottom comes from the Center for Good Food Purchasing's website, and it just shows that once an agency or an institution does adopt, these are essentially what happens. So there's a baseline assessment to look and see where that institution scores along all five of those value categories. Um, goals are set to improve scores across all those five value categories or wherever there is more improvement needed. Um, progress is tracked and then successes are celebrated. The state of the GFPP, so the orange dots represent all of the cities where the GFPP has been adopted. So um, recently we see adoption on the East Coast. That wasn't the case a year and a half ago, which is really exciting. I'm excited to hear from representatives from some of these cities who can speak to what adoption looks like um, and how it was pursued. The blue dots represent campaigns that are active. New York City is one of them. And that is because New York City's institutional meals, the scale of our institutional meals, our public plate is massive. Um, every year, this is from the food metrics report from this past year, every year there's more than 235 million meals and snacks that are served across all of our city agencies and institutions. That's a lot of food. Um, and it's served in our schools, homeless shelters, childcare centers, correctional facilities, our public hospitals. It's, um, it's a tremendous, amount of food that we are purchasing and then serving to a tremendous amount of um, constituents here in New York City. You can see in our bar graph that most of those meals are being served by the Department of Education, which makes sense considering how many students we have in, in that system here in New York City. And we'll go into a little bit of the detail about what that means moving forward. Um, this is also another answer to the question, why New York City? And the answer is that there is a lot of alignment already. Um, this infographic is explained in our report, but it just shows all of the policies that are aligned with the GFPP in New York City and New York State across the five value categories. And there's a lot. New York City is progressive in a lot of ways, um, specifically with our nutrition policies, um, our local economy commitment. So all of those really just speak to New York's ability to be um, a leader in GFPP adoption in the, on the East Coast as we continue to see campaigns start and move forward um, up and down the East Coast. So given that, given New York's position to really be that leader for GFPP adoption, our research, this round of research took four aims. Um, aims one and two are really to understand what procurement looks like in New York City from the perspective of two city agencies specifically, and then within the context of those two agencies, explore fit facilitators and barriers to adoption of the GFPP here in New York City. Um, and then aim three and four really get at our quantitative analysis. So we wanted to look at who we were vending with currently, where are we contracted, um, those organ or those businesses that we purchase from or procure from, um, who are the top 22, 
And then of those top 22, um, how do their values align with the GFPP? So a very preliminary analysis to see if there's any um, obvious overlap or obvious concerns um, before GFPP adoption would be pursued. So to assess those aims, we had a multi-method study design. So we um, employed a case study design to explore procurement and facilitators and barriers within our city agencies. Um, and those were mostly through semi-structured in-depth interviews um, with representatives from those city agencies, as well as representatives who did not um, fall under either of the two agencies we chose, but who could speak to procurement citywide, as well as their perception of any facilitators or barriers. Um, and then aims three and four, that quantitative piece, we um, reviewed contracts with the city using all public knowledge or public and publicly available information. So using New York City's open vendor portal, as well as um, filing FOIL requests through the city to kind of see what, or to definitely see where um, the money is being spent um, and how much is being spent. And then finally, once we had those top vendors, we um, used a survey, which was based off of the GFPP scoring, um, scoring guide to assess alignment with GFPP values. So at the end of it all, we had, um, we conducted interviews with 19 individuals representing 12 different institutions and organizations here in New York City. And then there's a further breakdown. So um, the, I don't think I mentioned this, our two agencies we looked at were the Administration for Children's Services and Human Resources Administration. Um, and we chose these because um, they're connected in a lot of ways to vulnerable populations, but they're also very, um, and cities impact in, in, in many different programs throughout the city, hundreds of programs even, all of our after school settings, our Head Start programs. Um, Human Resources Administration is responsible for all of our emergency food assistance programming. Um, so food banks, food pantries, impacts a lot of populations. So looking specifically in the realm of these two agencies, we thought would provide a lot of um, insight into what are some of the potential facilitators and barriers to adoption. Um, so we spoke with three institutions that would fall under the Administration for Children's Services bucket, and then we spoke with six who would fall under Human Resources Administration, and there were three additional institutions we spoke with um, who, again, wouldn't fall on either of those two buckets, but could lend some insight as well. Um, and then once we, for the AIMS 3 and 4, once we came up with our list of top vendors, 14 of those vendors responded to the survey, which was a really, um, I think, the positive but surprising um, response. I won't go into all of these because um, I will talk forever. However, I will say um, it was really exciting to see a lot of the facilitators, um, though there were barriers that we are excited to talk about in our report so that the coalition can use that moving forward to address. Um, but anyway, within the context of the Administration for Children's Services, some of the major barriers to emerge was um, a concern about infrastructure in New York City and the ability to store and process certain foods that might be more local or higher quality um, and inability to meet that demand with existing infrastructure was something that was continuously raised. Um, another aspect was this notion of transparency. We don't really know what everyone's doing. We don't know who everyone's contracted with across the city um, and not knowing that makes the decision to adopt a policy that could change procurement across the city um, a little bit uh, concerning for some organizations. Um, so that was something that a lot of the uh, individuals we spoke with um, wanted to be addressed. And then finally, this idea of campaign design, not so much a barrier, but a concern. So making sure that any um, campaign for a policy that would affect millions and millions of New Yorkers is at its core publicly supported and that there's a strategic investment to engage the public in whatever that campaign looks like. On the flip side, facilitators. Um, and this mirrors a lot of what I've talked about in terms of New York City being that leader in institutional procurement and um, already pursuing policies that are values-based. But again, so this idea of alignment, that there are um, policies and programs within the context of the uh, ACS that do look like what the GFPP would be asking them to do, um, which was promising. That there are existing resources that help these agencies and smaller organizations identify good vendors, good vendors, or vendors that supply better products or who adhere to local purchasing guidelines. 
um, partnerships. So this idea that group purchasing organizations, which are for-profit or collaboratives, which usually exist in the nonprofit sphere, that they can help to identify vendors and then um, join small organizations together to pursue and negotiate contracts that are fair prices for higher quality foods. Um, and then I think one of the more interesting facilitators to emerge was the idea of this ripple effect. Um, so one thing I will say about programs that fall under ACS as well as Human Resources Administration is that sometimes um, there might be an instance where they wouldn't be affected by the GSEP, that their policy in, um, is, is a state or a federally funded policy that would take precedence over something like the G GSEP, or it might not. That's something we want to study further. Um, nonetheless, regardless, that ripple effect might mean that um, a vendor that ACS contracts with or HRI contracts with in response to the GSEP would increase the quality of their foods or um, establish fairer prices. And then other organizations, aside from those directly impacted by GSEP adoption, could then take advantage of those lower prices or that higher quality food and kind of really just um, seek those, those same advantages and benefits. For the Human Resources Administration, again, these are emergency food providers, our food pantries, our food banks, both small and large. One of the biggest barriers to be raised was this idea of cost. Higher quality foods can sometimes cost more. And that was um, especially a concern considering that a lot of these organizations, their MO is to stretch their dollar as far as it will go and to feed as many as possible. So if they have to now adhere to a policy that is requiring that the food be of a certain um, it sounds funny as I say it, and they acknowledge that as well, the, the interviewees that we spoke with, um, you obviously want to serve the highest quality food that you can, no question. But at the end of the day, you also want to feed as many hungry people as possible. So there was this, I, this concern that these very stringent policy requirements could impact their ability to do just that, um, which is something worth exploring more. Um, also raised with this idea that increased regulation might not be a good thing, that they've seen struggles in other areas of the country where food banks were, um, there was a mandate that they must procure certain types of foods and that ended up hurting their ability to feed as many as possible, so a concern about that. Um, barriers in terms of access, so New York City's New York City is not Los Angeles, um, unfortunately. Our winters are very different, so weighing being able to provide a consistent supply of fresh food year round with something like a local economy's um, requirement. How does that work for New York City? And just wanting to understand more about, about that, the logistics of that. Um, and then a big one for the HRA was policy limitations. So HIPNAP or the Hunger Prevention and Nutrition Assistance Program and EFAP, Emergency Food Assistance Program. Um, HIPNAP is state-based, EFAP is city-based. These policies have um, requirements and they vend with specific vendors or contract with specific vendors. And so trying to navigate that really complex relationship if the GSEP were to be adopted was something that a lot of our interviewees noted as um, a potential barrier. On the flip side, the side I like better, the facilitators. So a lot of our interviewees noted that city council seems to be really receptive to comprehensive food policy right now. Um, there have been a slew of events this, um, this year alone where city council has truly literally said, I, you know, it's time for comprehensive food policies. And they noted that. And so that's um, a potential facilitator. Um, the idea that it's New York City and there are so many distributors, so many vendors, so many organizations and businesses that we could contract with. Um, and uh, that might not be the case in other cities around the country. And that's a, a big plus for New York. And then again, we see the same facilitators mentioned within the context of ACS, this alignment, that there are policies and programs in place that align with GSEP standards. Um, an example I will present is that for HIPNAP, um, for instance, there is a local procurement requirement within that policy. Aligns really well with the GSEP's local economy's um, value category. This ripple effect that even if a small food pantry is only adhering to HIPNAP policy and really isn't gonna be touched by the GFPP, there's a chance that the big vendor that the big food banks purchase from adjust their stand or adjust their standards for procurement and purchase and distribution, and then those smaller organizations can kind of piggyback off of that and experience the benefits that come from higher quality foods at lower costs. And then um, this collective purchase model, which is actually in the works here in New York City among our food assistance programs, 
um, which would ultimately allow all of the organizations in New York that exist in this sphere to negotiate contracts that are fairer and that supply higher quality foods to more programs. Um, so that's our qualitative piece. Our quant piece aims three and four, where we were looking at vendors and contract amounts. We ascertained this number. So this is the number that represents how much money New York City is in contracts with for food currently, and as well as um, there are a couple of contracts that ended in February of this year, which is when we were conducting this research. Um, it's a lot of money, $820 million. I think what's most surprising, that, or not surprising, but illuminating is that when we go to this slide, we take the DOE out, we're left with 62 million. Um, so two things, 62 million is still a very big number. We're still talking about a lot of money that's spent on a lot of food that's feeding a lot of people. However, the DOE makes up the lion's share of that number. And so looking at the Department of Education as a strategic um, adopter of the GFCP is something that the coalition um, is going to be exploring and it's something that we would recommend as well. Um, and then so our vendor survey, once those top 22 vendors were identified in terms of contract amount, we um, sent them a survey that was based on, again, our, the GFCP scorecard. So within the nutrition value category, how would an institution receive the top rating? And then using those scores to create a survey that these organizations and businesses could respond to um, and kind of report on where they are in terms of alignment. Um, some of the bigger takeaways um, is that there are there seems to be a recorded alignment with the GFP's local economy values category. So of the 14 vendors who took our survey, more than two thirds stated that they do source products from local producers or manufacturers. Um, and the definition that the GFP and we used on that survey was food that's purchased from within 250 miles for produce and 500 miles for meat. So that does change based on your location, which I'm sure some of our um, panelists can speak to as well. Um, and then an additional um, takeaway, a positive takeaway was that the majority of vendors who participated in the survey stated that they do follow a social um, responsibility policy, which is um, hopeful for the environmental sustainability piece. Um, that said, there are some areas where the reported response would indicate that there is work to be done. We go into a lot of this response in depth in our report, so I encourage you to read that when it comes out. Um, before I wrap up, one of the things that we do talk about in our report is um, where we go next. Who do we talk to next? What do we pursue next? And one of those um, next steps is to really take a look at the Department of Correction here in New York City. Um, they serve more than 10, almost 10 million, near, 10 million meals and snacks annually, which is a lot. Um, so scale is there. However, in addition to just that scale, the Department of Correction has taken some pretty significant steps to um, improve the quality of food that they're serving in all their correction facilities. Um, down at the bottom of this slide, I had some of the major developments that have um, been initiated starting back in the late 90s, so eliminating fat fryers, standardizing recipes across all correctional facilities, which makes it easy to consider ordering food that is higher quality and that could be supplied to all of the centers. Um, eliminating sugar-sweetened beverages, going down from, or starting with whole milk and now only 1% milk is served. And then I think the more interesting piece is that recently the Department of Correction put out um, an RFP for local eggs and they awarded um, that contract to Common Market, which is an organization on the East Coast that is very much focused on local economies and providing foods that are um, local and sustainable. So that was, in light of all of these developments and, and, and movement toward um, values-based purchasing and high quality foods, we really think that the Department of Correction is something to take a deeper look into moving forward. Um, so from all of this, we have um, 10 recommendations that we would make for the New York City Coalition, um, for New York City institutions and agencies, and then as well as for future research. Um, I'll briefly, I think I have a couple minutes, I'll just go through a couple of these or a brief overview of all of them. Um, Grow NYC, so they have a food, food hub that they're expanding. Um, and this was consistently raised as a potential solution to this barrier of, of infrastructure and a lack thereof. Um, and so uh, really looking at how that can be used to um, meet the scale of New York City's institutional food procurement. Um, working with 
city institutions to identify strategies for aligning current policies with the potential adoption of another policy, um, specifically HIPNAP and EFAP with the GSPP. Um, number three, back to that big old number that the DOE um, has going for it, it, looking at the Department of Education um, to advocate for that agency as a GSP early adopter. Um, there's no denying that that's a lot of food and it's a lot of, a lot of people who are eating that food. So really targeting that agency is something um, worth exploring. Um, number four, those collective purchasing models, test and, and potentially adopt them so that um, more affordable contracts can be established. Uh, and that the transition to a GSPP procurement approach would be easier. Um, number five goes back to one of those barriers slash concerns, making sure that the campaign is really working to hone that public awareness and then that public support, which I can attest that they're very much um, on board with. Uh, for agencies and institutions, looking at the potential for group purchasing models to support institutions, so not just organizations and not just small um, community-based organizations, but institutions at large to pursue vendors that better align with those GSPP values. Um, this number seven um, is raised in response to conversations with um, New York State Department of Ag and Markets um, staff members who um, really noted that a tracking system needs to happen to monitor procurement, both here in the city, but statewide, it's really hard to find those numbers and those contracts. And so making that more transparent is going to help um, not only in the adoption of a policy like the GSPP, but just also in terms of having information that's available to the public. Um, and then number eight is a bit more granular, but looking at the potential for policies that already exist, like the emergency food assistance program to um, add other potential um, food options. So local fresh, for instance. And then finally for future research, um, developing tools and resources that can help institutions programs identify GSPP aligned vendors to make the transition easier so that it's not let me go research for a year. It's no, here are the, the vendors we've looked at. They, they have it going for them. It's easy to just, you know, switch over here. And um, so that's something to pursue. And then finally, like I had mentioned earlier, conducting um, a more in-depth case study on the Department of Correction um, and their ability to um, normalize a lot of the policies and programs that they're implementing um, through adoption of the GSPP. I think that's it. That'll be published at the end of the month, so I hope you all read it and learn more. Thank you, Carly. That was uh, nearly a year's worth of work, and congratulations on finishing that up. And, and just a Sort of point of clarification, um, we're still in May, so the end of the month it will be the end of June when the full report will be published. Um, I want to welcome our panelists to come up. So represented here, we have uh, folks who've been involved with the Good Food Purchasing Program. Uh, in various campaigns, both in New York City around the country and around the country. And um, they'll be able to provide some real world context as to you know, what it looks like when a city adopts a GFPP, what it looks like when there's interest to adopt a GFPP, and what it looks like when there's no interest, but there's some desire for you know, some change to local procurement and the seeds of the GFPP are possibly there. So um, I'm not going to go too deep into their bios. We have sheets there on the table. I'm just going to do uh, quick introductions. To my right here, we have uh, Chloe Waterman, who currently serves as program manager for Friends of the Earth. Next to Chloe, we have Susanna Daly, who is a labor, organizi labor organizer, a human rights attorney, and a former New York City school educator, and currently works with the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Next to Suzanne, we have John Stoddard, who is the New England Regional Coordinator for Healthcare Without Harm. And last but not least, we have Rivka Gitacho, who is the director of the GFPP campaign here in New York City. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming. So I'm going to start off with Suzanne. Uh, 
we got a little bit of background on the GFPP, but for those who aren't so intimately familiar with it, I'd like for you to sort of set the sort of uh, national context for the GFPP. Can you describe, you know, some of the characteristics of the places where it's being pursued currently and provide some general sense of the various campaigns and adoptions around the country? start by just in talking about like um, the intersection of the Searching Northern Alliance and, and the GFPP program. Um, so we're a bi-national organization of 33 worker-based organizations. I'm sorry, one thing. Unfortunately, our mics are very not very sensitive, so you have to really, oh. like you're doing a rap battle. Closer <laughs> or yeah. farther? Closer. Oh, okay. There you, there you go. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, 33 worker-based organizations, including um, a handful of large unions and worker centers um, that are led by or organize frontline food workers. Um, and, you know, the food economy is the largest economy, be, you know, larger than the healthcare economy, and it's also the most exploitive. Um, and I'm talking about the food economy, which is sort of the entire chain and every form of labor that is involved in the food economy. And so, um, we sort of began as sort of a mission to sort of like work to improve the conditions uh, for food workers uh, by building alliances and uh, movements with larger food uh, justice movements. And um, that led to our collaboration with local food policy councils, um, and particularly in LA, um, uh, beginning in about 2010, they sort of began to have conversations as to how you know our um, intersecting interests in um, changing the food system can come together to help sort of build a policy um, in in which you know we can have a, um, a say in how food is sourced. And so um, the LA Food Policy Council uh, sort of became, which we were we were a part of, sort of be, sort of became the main catalyst in, in building this. And um, you know, and, and essentially, you know. Um, you become familiar with, you know, what the program, uh, what the policy, what the policy sort of like um, the meat of the policy is around the five uh, value areas. And the program is something bigger. The program involves policy, but it also involves sort of the movement sort of like built around GCP, which is the coalition building, the partnerships of the institutions, and then the subsequent sort of like work to implement it. Um, and we see GOCP, you know, as a movement to sort of like help build the kinds of um, coalitions that could realize a GFP policy and realize the implementation of it, but then also use its power to then maybe even go sort of, you know, beyond GFPP in the future. And so with that in mind, you know, we've sort of built alliances in several different cities um, around the U.S. And, you know, GFPP um, sort of became a popular in sort of this food policy world, and it's kind of been sort of taken on by some institutions in some cities where we're not involved, um, and there's not necessarily policy, but the institutions are involved at least in doing a baseline assessment. Um, but in the cities where we have been involved, including sort of starting with Los Angeles and then moving to uh, like San Francisco and Oakland and then um, Chicago and Cook County, and then now on the East Coast with Boston and DC, adopting a policy, um, and recent, most recently Cincinnati. And, um, and several of those cities, our member-based organizations have been um, leaders in, the, um, in, in those efforts. Um, and, you know, and it, the efforts sort of like manifest differently in every city, sort of depending on the factors and the circumstances, you know, and the layout um, of, you know, who's who and who's participating. Um, but we, you know, we've seen um, already the strong impact that GCP um, could have um, in Los Angeles where it for, where was first passed, and in particular in supporting labor rights. I and mean, we've been able to use GCP as leverage to win a fair contract for truck, work, for truck drivers who distribute food to, the, to LA schools. We recently used it um, also for warehouse workers 
to leverage a, a union for warehouse workers. We've used it also to keep, um, to cancel contracts from um, companies that have egregious labor violations like Tyson. Um, and, and with that in mind, from, from the labor point of view, that's how we, um, that's how, you know, the, our vision in sort of like using GACP and, and similar policies. Um, but, you know, throughout all our sort of involvement in these um, campaigns, you know, the, the two sort of values and principles that we are censoring is transparency because nothing is available, like nothing is available to us without transparency. And these are public dollars. And this is a process in participatory democracy, really. And, you know, so transparency is key. And then also censoring racial equity. And then looking how policy and subsequent policies and the coalitions that we build uh, could also be used to basically um, repair the harm of systematic and structural discrimination against black communities and other people of color who have been kept um, from land and from production and like to see the opportunities for them to also benefit um, from a program like that. So I'm curious, uh, direct this to John and Chloe. The way that um, Suzanne described using the adoption of the GFPP approach as an advocacy tool to leverage against certain uh, labor practices, was that some of the thinking for either of your organizations in participating in the GFPP campaign, or were you just looking to establish a sort of you know, a baseline approach towards the various value categories that you're interested in and then see what happens? Um, so I don't know if that was exactly what we had in mind. We have, um, we work with healthcare. My organization works with healthcare institutions. Uh, we don't really have a, a city hospital. So the GFPP wasn't necessarily going to directly affect the constituency of folks that we work with, but we, we were hoping that the GFPP would serve to inspire hospitals in Boston. We have a lot of them to follow some of these standards. Um, um, and that, you know, the city itself, not necessarily put pressure on it, but sort of lead by example. Um, getting to some of uh, what Suzanne was sharing, I think we are seeing, so we worked closely with a city councilor, um, Michelle Wu, who's, who's great. Um, she continues to communicate. We passed in March, and she continues to communicate with us and, and sort of rely on the coalition. So I think to, to get to what some of what you were saying, I, I, I think there is some of that. She's now looking at us. Um, she wants us to sort of serve um, on, in um, the implementation process, et cetera. Um, so I didn't go into this work sort of with what um, Suzanne had shared with all those things in mind, but I think that's starting to manifest, I would say. And for us, um, is this working? Yes, but, but again, hold it. Oh, sorry, okay. So for us in DC, our coalition, I think, is somewhat unique given that so many of us are representing national organizations that are working on GFPP at the national level and happen to have representation in DC. Plus, we had local partners. So our main local coalition leader is a food justice organization called DC Greens. And I think they were really looking at it from a holistic view. They cared about all of the value categories. And I would say most of our coalition members have come to be motivated by all of the value categories. But I think different groups came to the coalition and were, are participating for different reasons. So we have the Center for Science and the Public Interest. They're mostly interested in the, in the nutrition side and those nutrition standards. Um, I work for Friends of the Earth, um, primarily on shifting menus at school districts and cities and counties toward more plant-based foods as a climate and public health solution. So for us, um, both in the environmental and sustainability and animal welfare standards. Um, there are ways that you can um, get rewarded with the Good Food Purchasing Program by reducing the volume of factory farmed meat and dairy that you're serving. So that was a particular interest for us. But I think what the power of the program has been and what's worked really well for us in DC is bringing these allies together that might not normally partner to work on something because maybe their organization just cares about one value category. So for instance, Common Market, who was mentioned earlier for supplying eggs um, here to Rikers Island, is one of our coalition partners because they really care about this local economies piece. 
and um, they see a benefit from them on that. But they also were totally down to advocate for um, a valued workforce and for environmental sustainability. So we've kind of, I, I'd say there were some ideas that individual groups came with is how they'd like to use the program to lev leverage specific interests, but the power of it has been in aligning behind a shared set of goals and putting all of that normally diffused power um, toward one uh, cohesive stream for the policy. And um, the GFPPs look different in different cities. So for example, in Washington, D.C., the uh, legislation that was put in place focuses specifically on schools. And in Boston, it was more of a citywide approach. Ripka, I'm wondering which do you think is a good fit for New York City and why? This really is like a rap battle. <laughs> the good thing is that we're all on the same team, though. <laughs> um, so we're really intent on making sure that this is a citywide policy. Um, we are pretty sure that that's the best approach and really the only approach that we can take in New York City to ensure that we signal to the marketplace that we have a real stake in determining the direction of values-based procurement. Um, and we think it's likely, honestly. I mean, as of last year, he contracted uh, with the Center for Good Food Purchasing, which, as Kylie mentioned, um, is, has been the instrumental partner on a national level for various campaigns throughout the country. Um, they were the ones that actually developed the standard, and per their contract with the city, they agreed to uh, identify the, the ways in which five to start city agencies of the ten that procure food here in New York City um, to identify exactly where those purchasing dollars are going. So as of, as of even earlier than uh, 2018, we've been seeing some conversations emerging um, on the part of the city to identify what, what steps we can take to meaningly, meaningfully implement values-based procurement. Um, to start, the city and the center contracted to look at the Department of Education and the uh, health and hospitals, our municipal hospital system, um, to achieve a baseline score, to, to understand what um, steps we need to take to achieve a baseline score in each of the five value categories for those city agencies. And that's actually already been completed. Three more city agencies are slated to have baseline assessments conducted. Um, those are three city agencies that procure food through the DCAS, through the, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. So that's HRA, Human Resources Administration, um, ACS, Administration for Children's Services, and Department of Corrections. So those baseline numbers um, are going to be are, are going to be um, completed and conducted shortly within within hopefully the next year year and a half or so. Um, so we're already seeing that initial commitment, um, and then we're also just seeing aligned policies as as has been mentioned. Before. I mean, we have commitments on the part of the mayor per his one NYC 2050 plan, which is a, a really robust plan to have New York City be the most equitable, most just. Uh, and sustainable city um, in the world. And it's, it's a pretty extensive plan. Um, and, and one of the volumes of the plan, the Healthy Lives Report, actually mentions from the voice of the mayor and, and, and everyone who's worked on this plan um, that a good food purchasing policy will be implemented. We're not sure exactly um, what was intended by that statement. However, we do know that there's been a public commitment that a good food purchasing policy makes sense for New York City. Um, we're also seeing just even within that that there's been uh, a commitment to reduce beef procurements by 50% by 2030. We're seeing a Meatless Mondays initiative that just launched this year too, um, where earlier in the school year we had about 15 pilot public schools um, enacting this Meatless Mondays initiative, and it was just announced earlier this year that Meatless Mondays is going to go into effect for all 18 or so hundred public schools uh, in New York City as of the start of this upcoming school year. Um, we're also just seeing that, you know, beyond the commitments that have been made this year within the 2015 report, that there are um, laws like Local Law 50, which commit the city to purchasing uh, locally sourced goods from our state, from our city, 
um, and making sure that there's a commitment within that law to uh, to publish that data through the mayor's of mayor's office of, of not criminal services of contract services um, to ensure that the public has information to what goods are are published are purchased from our local region. Um, and then I'll also just quickly say that the Department of Education actually just in their latest and largest round of solicitations um, that they just put out within the last few weeks, they've actually started integrating some very baseline uh, and preliminary good food purchasing language that speaks to the five different value categories. So we're seeing a commitment, and to your question, Craig, um, as to whether or not this is feasible on a citywide level, I honestly think that we have no option, and I think the city has been setting itself up to make sure that this is going to be feasible and this is going to be the basis of our advocacy efforts. And John, can you walk us through uh, the rationale in Boston behind uh, a citywide adoption approach and the, the sort of origins of the, the campaign process up through you know, the legislation and adoption? Sure. Um, so Boston's different than New York City um, in that, well, in many ways. But um, in one, the one way is that um, most of what most of the food that the city purchases is for Boston Public Schools. Um, there's a little bit in different departments, but I think you know you say it's a citywide um, approach, um, but it really affects BPS. That's that's the main um, uh, agency that it affects. Um, we also didn't necessarily have to um, put a ton of strategy or thought into sort of do we focus on schools or do we focus on the city. Um, we uh, The stars are really aligned for us. Um, we The GFPP passed like a 